Ben Vallis here with First of the Floor. Thank you for joining us. Hope you're doing well. Alongside me, Wayne Spoonie. Spoonie, how's it going, man? I'm doing good, Ben. We got to get the three of us on again here soon. I know we've been, I know. been busy, but it's just been two man pods here and there. So I'm back. I'm good. Feels good. I keep thinking in my head, 44 and 12. What a great record. And then I realized <laughs> nope. they're 54 and 12, 14. I mean, like, it's just insane. Like, my brain is stuck at like, 30 games over 500 they're 40 games over 500 it feels fake to say that like it's a made up like record or something yeah it really does and what we've won one championship in our lifetime but uh, even just the amount of times we've come close to winning 60 games in our lifetime is few and far between so i'm i'm stuck between like one day i'm enjoying this isn't this fun let's enjoy the journey let's enjoy the process to like it don't mean a thing without a ring mentality (laughs) and i kind of ebb and flow between the two so uh, i'm sure most of the fans out there are struggling with the same mentality so when we're here we're living through it together and we're having a good time and uh, speaking of having a good time, like you said, shout out to Jake Eisenberg, who's not on this one. We're, we're piecing together lineups at this point later right. in the season, just like the Celtics are. Look, we're <laughs> going to get into the Pistons game yesterday, which was undeservedly enjoyable. It was a ridiculously fun time, um, given that it was a late March game or a mid-March game against a, a middling or, or less than middling Detroit Pistons team. We're going to rank the vibiest moments from that game. We're going to preview the Bucks game as well. And if we've got time, we'll get into some of the stuff said about the Celtics on the new LeBron James, JJ Reddick podcast. But first, please like this stream. Hit that like button. Subscribe to the First of the Floor podcast as well. Sign up to our playback room, playback.tv slash Celtics blog, where you can watch live Celtics games with myself, with Spoonie, with Jake, with other members of the Celtics blog crew as well. Three Leaf Clover, which is Spoonie's weekly Celtics blog column. I believe you've just just put one out, Spoonie, or you've just got one coming? I, I've got one come in at the end of this week. I missed, I've been off kilter. My actual job that like feeds my family and keeps the <laughs> clothes on our backs has been very yep. busy recently. So I, I've had a little off schedule, but I'm getting back in schedule on this week. Little statistical comparison. This won't jinx us at all between 2008 <laughs> and this se- regular season. So nice. yeah, sorry if we lose in the Eastern Conference <laughs> Final. That's on me. It will be Spoonie's fault. Uh, the Discord channel, which has become a, a hotbed of uh, intelligent Celtics conversation, none of which is due to me, but there's a lot of smart people in there dropping a lot of interesting Celtics-based statistics and facts and, and interesting tidbits, which is great. Uh, merch store as well. The, the links for the Discord cord and merch are in the description below. As well, if you like this podcast, check out the Celtics Lab podcast, the How About Them Celtics podcast. It's both under the CLNS media umbrella. Uh, Similar vibes, similar good times. So go subscribe to their channels and check those guys out as well. Finally, we've got Cedric Maxwell, the 1981 NBA Finals MVP, former Boston Celtic, current Celtics broadcaster for the radio squad there with Sean Grandy. Coming on the pod, 6 p.m., Thursday night live here on YouTube. So make sure you subscribe to the channel. We're going to be talking everything about the Bucks game that'll have just happened the day prior, as well as previewing the upcoming postseason run for the Celtics. So that's going to be a lot of fun. We're really looking forward to having Max on the show. Okay, game recap. Celtics, they did beat Detroit in the end, funnily Indeed. enough. 119 to 94. The hot crowd there, Spoonie, capping off a six game winning streak, the sixth different streak for the Celtics of so five or more wins. This season, they now only need to go five and nine to clinch the first seed, nine and five to clinch the overall top seed in the league. It, it seems to be happening, Spoony. Uh, but this game was a lot of fun. What were your thoughts on this one? Yeah. Okay. Can I just say, like, it's a Tuesday night in Boston against the friggin' lowly Detroit Pistons. Cade Cunningham's not playing. Whatever Thompson they have, Amen, I think, isn't playing. And the crowd was reacting like it was a playoff. That's why it's the best fans in the NBA, dude. Mm -hmm. Like, great crowd, great game, great vibes. I mean, there's just a massive talent deficit between these two teams, even with our skeleton crew we were running out. Because they're running out of skeleton crew, too. Like, um, Oh, yeah. 
I did find the Pistons more impressive than the Wizards, who are like, I don't want to call them ass because ass has like some positive <laughs> qualities. You know what I mean? Like they deposit, yeah. you know, waste out of our bodies. Like the Wizards were worse than ass, whatever that is. They were like toe hair or something like that. Appendix. Um, Take that yeah, shit out. They're, yeah, there we go. Yeah, yeah, something you can literally just remove with no consequences. <laughs> Um, and like the Pistons, I thought they played pretty hard. They've got like that big beastly dude, Amarani, Amara- who I'm sure I butchered his name. Um, but this team is so locked in to the way they want to play basketball. And like we used to see this team when they play bad teams in the f- past few years, like not really running stuff, just like trying to overcome these bad teams with their talent, um, getting into the ISO game. They were flying all over the court on both ends in in a game that really essentially means nothing to the Celtics. And I think the biggest thing that Joe has done throughout the season is empowered these deep bench guys. And like Peyton Pritchard looked like the be- like he would have been the best player on the Pistons last night, yeah, and dude. like by a long shot, right? And like you would never have believed that at the beginning of the season, but Joe has done such a good job putting these guys into positions to succeed. Their confidence goes up, and as your confidence grows, you start playing better. It's like the opposite of what happened to Neesmith here in Boston, right? You see him go to Indy, gets to play, gets to make mistakes, confidence grows, and now he's a great player. And like every single dude on the bench is like playing at 100% potential right now. It's amazing. Yeah, that was definitely the standout takeaway for me as well. And approaching so many of these games now that we've entered the quote unquote easiest stretch of the schedule, even though we're about to come up against the second seed Bucks, has been like, I could absolutely forgive these guys for losing this game, for coming out and just like pissing this one down their legs and would take them out. We've seen bugger all Tatum free games so far uh, this season. What's the team going to look like without their best player, albeit against one of the worst teams in the league? You could absolutely forgive them for just coming out and having a lackluster performance. But Missoula has these guys so motivated, top to bottom, to play the right way on both ends, seemingly every possession, like right down to the end in this one, which is just insane and borderline unfair and unreasonable (laughs) and immoral to do that against a team (laughs) like the Pistons. Um, And given what we've seen historically from this like Tatum and Brown-led Celtics, it's still unbelievable when you see that product on the court. Like It still amazes me that they show up for these games because it was just so characteristic and typical of prior Celtics teams to just not. Um, So that's been amazing. Jaden Ivey was probably the the standout for the the Pistons there. I think just before we get on to to ranking the vibiest moments here, Spoonie, you you said in our, our Discord, I think like or maybe it was Twitter, like that they're using Jaden I- Ivey differently now, and that's it's a relief to see because they were kind of burying him earlier in the season. Mm-hmm. What did you see from from the Jaden I- Ivey perspective? Yeah, I, I think part of this is Cade's been in and out of the bet. Like he doesn't make a lot of sense with Cade to me because they both really need the ball in their hands to be at their best. Like Cade can be an off ball spacer, but you're sort of wasting having a six foot seven like ball handling point guard when you're just like, hey, go space to the corner, buddy. But earlier in the season, like I think he was coming off the bench and he was like spacing out to the corner and like just kind of a cut and attack closeout guys and he can make threes, but he's not the type of three-point shooter where you have to close out hard on him. And then finally, like really around the turn of the year, they were like, here's the ball, Jaden. Go do things with it. And boy, can he do things with it. Like that dude is electrically fast. Like it is crazy. Um, And he was a big fan uh, or friend of the program, Matt Penny, who we used to have on, has since yeah. retired from the content game was always a big Jaden Ivy guy. So I kind of been paying attention to him as well. Um, and he's just real. He's going to be a really, really good offensive player. I think he's got a lot of weaknesses defensively just because he's pretty slight frame, but yeah. he's just in that like long line of absurdly athletic guards with like incredible handles. And he's a pretty solid passer. And like you saw it, there was times where he just kind of was like f it like no one on my team is good so i'm just gonna attack like three celtics in semi transition and he was getting to the rim and scoring at times so like put the ball in his hands empower him to make plays get guys open um and we didn't see duran at his best but him and duran have some nice chemistry too 
Um, so he's a he's a bright spot for Detroit. I just don't he doesn't really make sense for their team though, which is no. classic Pistons. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. They're and their highest paid coach as well. Uh and <laughs> yeah, James Wiseman. Right. We you didn't you say we didn't see uh Duran at his best. We saw James Wiseman at his worst again, yes. which might just be his like constant state of being yeah. uh dominated by Luke Cornett. Uh, added to the the Luke Cornett list of domination that's uh, becoming a growing list at this point in the season, uh, which is great to see from the Celtics perspective. Not great to see from the James Wiseman fandom uh, perspective, but good on Jaden Ivey for at least uh, showing some resistance to the Celtics and making this game somewhat interesting. Uh, Muse31 saying uh, Evan Fortier in the chat, um, I know, who dude. I believe was fined coming out of the, the prior game for kicking the ball into the stands, just <laughs> continuing this incredible run of bad vibes in the life it's of a very Fournier. Frenchman <laughs> thing to do, I feel like. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, mad kicks the ball. Uh, that was my ter- <laughs> terrible French accent. I apologize. It, yeah. yeah. Uh, no filter. All right, let's get into ranking the vibiest moments from this game, which is, is definitely the right approach to take with this one, Spoonie, um, because like we said, it was uh, undeservedly enjoyable for a game at this juncture yeah. of the season. I think we're just going to go back and forth. I'll start with the obvious one, the easy top of the rankings pile here, which is the Derek White triple double. I uh, do believe I have a clip here somewhere that I can run while I talk about the incredible Derek White triple double. So this is the clip of the final play. They're at a nice little, nice little off ball action to get Peyton Pritchard a not very open at all three point attempt yeah. to give Derek White his tenth assist, uh, which is great to see. Prior to that, floundering a lot, and playing very un Derek White basketball spoon. He's trying to get that tenth assist, which was hilarious <laughs> to see. But you know, Derek White in this one came out like a flamethrower from three, just jacking up that three point shot. Now uh, with no hesitation at all and just playing the way that apparently his father Richard White encouraged him to play which is just to get them up Um, but he made this game look easy he was cutting through the Pistons quote-unquote defense like a a hot knife through butter Um, and it just looked like he was out there running drills essentially but to see a guy as cool and as lovable as Derek White finally get a triple double at this point in his career was awesome to see yeah dude and it's so well deserved because like Derek has always been like the sum is greater than his counting stats. So to see him get rewarded with some gaudy stat, like, cause he's been putting up some numbers since that basically really all season, but mm-hmm. um, it's great that plus he had like another absurd block too. That was just yes. like incredible chase down <laughs> style, like Marcus smart uh, against Norm Powell to save the series type of block. Um, and he's just diamond people up. He's making all the right decisions. And I cannot believe the jump shot he has now is oh the same God. human's jump shot as when he first got to the Celtics. Like, he just looks so hesitant. His feet were all over the place. Um, not that it was, like, totally broken, but now he has, like, this short, compact stroke that he just, like, rises up and fight. He looks like he's like taking curry threes sometimes. Like, oh, you're going to, you're not even, you're not going to get over the top of that screen. Bang 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 and the fact that his entire career he's sort of been plagued with a somewhat of a lack of confidence like and then you look at what he did last night I think he had like nine threes in the first half that I think he pulled the trigger nine times just in the first half ended with 12 um, and of course didn't play a ton of the fourth quarter so uh just an awesome awesome game uh and frankly well deserved I didn't I didn't see a single Derek White rebound but I'm glad he was getting those you know, I just wasn't paying attention until you get to like oh he's got you know 29 yeah. and 8 and it's like oh let's see him get aboard you know but uh yeah. it was just just an incredible performance from Derek and it just goes to show our third fourth fifth best player uh is borderline all-star level which is incredible <laughs> It's insane. It's so good. Yeah. I can't wait to see him in the playoffs. And yeah, you mentioned it, like his jump shot. His his shot pocket is so tight. There's so little wasted movement. Just yeah. it, It's so fluid as well, just from getting the feet set and that very little motion that has him going straight up and the shot pocket. Very curry-like, like you said, like very, very tight. Uh, and such a difference from when he came uh, to the Celtics not that long ago. So an amazing improvement. I would love to get whoever taught Derek White to shoot in my life and teach me how to shoot as well, Spoody. I need that desperately. Um, before too, we, man. yeah, before we head on to number two in our vibiest rankings here, we'll just tack this on as well. This is Derek White being interviewed after the Congratulations game. on your first triple double here in your career. Ah! I should have known. I should have known. <laughs> I know, I know, I'm not very subtle. 
Luke Cornett, not very subtle. Al Horf and Son. Not very subtle. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, just the, the vibes. I think, I, I, if you I haven't know. sensed the theme of this show, that's what it's all about after this one. Um, but just adds to the, the Derek White magic from this one. All right, Spoonie, what would you rank as the, the number two vibiest moment from this game? Okay, I've been trying to keep this to myself, Ben. Um, <laughs> I'm trying not to like poison the good vibes with negativity, injury concerns. But look, man, KP missed, what, four games? Uh I was getting a little worried, getting a little worried. And then to see him him come out and then just, like, start gunning the ball the second he's (laughs) touching it against this crappy Detroit team was just so good. It, like, eased all my anxieties. He looked totally fine. He's clearly on a minutes restriction, which is good. I hope he's on a minutes restriction no matter how healthy he is until Mm -hmm. the playoffs. Just, like, keep that man in bubble wrap, have him play, like, once, twice a week. 22 to 28 30 minutes that's all good um and yeah I like I didn't think he looked slowed down at all and maybe part of that's playing Detroit but like he's just so good he can come in and get 20 and 8 in 22 minutes and 5 and 9 for 3 and it's not a big deal so it was just very good to see KP back so that's my number two yeah, just immediately effective everywhere. The rim defense, mm-hmm. for one, defensively, spacing the floor and just like actually knocking down his three at an insanely high efficiency in this one. And then just such a threat in the paint as well, on the boards in both on both ends. Uh, and just that end of shot clock safety net where you could just throw it into the yeah. big fella for like maybe the highest efficiency look of the game. And that's like your emergency end of shot clock look as well. So it was just the, it's easy to forget because of how team this how good this team rather has been without Porzingis to, to forget just how effective and, and how much he adds to this team. And then within like 30 seconds, you're like, holy fucking shit, man. This huge right. like, good guy is like the best person <laughs> that's ever entered my personal universe. So very thankful for KP and a rightful uh, second place ranking in the vibiest moments of the game. Um, I'll add, let's see, the all-female broadcast, I think brought some good vibes and, and not necessary, but a welcome vibes shift in this one um who was it? we had uh zora stevenson who covers big 10 women's ball on the sort of play-by-play call along with abby chin uh and uh dijonet D- 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 yeah dijonet Dij- i think yeah dijonet carrington uh who's Dijonais, a guard for the okay. connecticut suns <laughs> Uh, and ESPN's Kayla Burton as well. And they were incredible. Uh, there was a, a really nice combination of like knowledge for the game overall, but then Zora Stevenson kind of had a lack of the traditional uh, Celtics knowledge of the game, of the game yeah. like what Geno time was and what some of the traditional aspects of Celtics games are. And Abby Chin did a really good job of sort of... Um, you know, filling that groove and ingratiating them all to that side of the Celtics uh, world. So I thought that was an interesting wrinkle. Uh, What'd you think of the all-female broadcast in this one, Spoonie? Yeah, dude, I was like blown away by Zora on the play-by-play. I thought she was really, really good as a Uh play-by-play person. So I bet she'll be out of the Big Ten and out of college ball and up to like kind of the bigger games. I wonder if she'll do some March Madness games too, but I thought she was great. Um, And Abby is just... She's just the best, dude. Like she was, she's just really naturally good at it. I thought she was like a little quiet, at, like not quite in, interjecting at, for like the first half of the first quarter, and then she got. Which you know, I get it. I would be like frozen statue at trying to do like color commentary. I, obviously, yeah. Abby's much better at this than I am. Um, and then she just really started to warm up, and I just thought she was awesome. She has a good combination of like deep knowledge of the team, the history, kind of the culture. And she's like clearly just a fan who also gets excited when the Celtics do cool stuff. Mm -hmm. And I like that. Like, I actually think I'm one of the few scowl defenders in the world at this point. Um, But sometimes it's nice to have somebody who kind of matches the energy of the game a little bit. But scowl does that too. But, um, but I just, I thought Abby was great. And then I was also on the playback. So I did not hear, I wasn't on the playback, but I was watching the playback. So I didn't hear a ton of it, but Mm -hmm. yeah, I thought it was a really good mix. I thought they all did great. I think it's cool to have kind of guest spots like that. Like I like when Eddie house comes in and does it too, just to get like a different voice in there once in a while. Like, like I like scal, but 80, 82 games is a lot. You know what I mean? Like maybe like 65 a scal wouldn't be so bad. Um, so yeah, I, th- I thought it was absolutely great. I had no, I think I was the only person who didn't realize it was happening. <laughs> yeah, just, right. <laughs> I totally missed it. And I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. So very much enjoyed it. 
Yeah, I only wish they did more of it. Uh, whether it's an all-female broadcast multiple times per year or just shuffling the broadcast crew every now and then. We've kind of been lucky this season that we've had half Gorman and half Drew Carter. Yeah. Lots of Scowl, which is fine. I like Scowl as well. I really like the way that he uh, reads the game and um, kind of like translates what he's seeing into like a human readable or listenable format. And I, I often find that I learn something about the game listening to Scowl. But shuffling it up and, and giving us a different look and different perspectives from the broadcast perspective I think uh, isn't highlighted as an, as important as it should be um, so it was really yeah. good to see that that shuffling up uh, in this one and again just adding to the good vibes of this one speaking of said vibes Spoonie what do you got next for us alright I'm just going to start this one out with a video in August and Abby Chin is the queen of TD Garden and I'll be here for the rest of the season I was going to say yeah. <laughs> It's hard not to rank this one number one, let's be honest. <laughs> same, same. I, it took all of my objective fibers in my soul to not go with him over KP. But Jordan Walsh, big dunk, massive two, two and two line in like four and a half <laughs> minutes. Uh, just completely changed the game when he came out there with his energy and rebounding and defensive uh, awareness, except for one or two plays where he kind of got got, but that's okay. He's a rookie. <laughs> um, we love Walshy. Like part of it's kind of a meme and just for fun, but he also represents something the Celtics will need as this team gets extremely extraordinarily expensive and that is like cheap solid bench players like there's no guarantee sam hauser's on this team after next season because he's gonna get paid man like max Struess makes 15 million a year i don't know how much worse sam hauser is than him and the mm -hmm. caps going up so he could be seeing that type of number so we actually like if we can develop guys like walsh for the long term this team is going to be elite for a very very long time and look, dude, it's just fun when your rookie gets out there and he smashes a dunk down. Yeah, we don't see enough of him. But yeah, uh, Walsh or, or Drew Peterson, guys like that who yeah. are in the development cycle, the early stages of it, uh, it's going to be really important to see uh, how they go. And yeah, 2-2-2, two, two, and 100% two, from the field for Walshie, one yeah. of one, per 36 numbers off the fucking charts. Uh, we love to see that from our guy, Walshie. Uh, next for me is just Jalen Brown returning after the game off and just looking like he's not... Not that you would expect that he's lost a step or any rhythm. Um, I guess the rhythm is the key focus there. Like just still yeah. completely in his bag. Uh, has not lost any of that rhythm at all. 31, 7, and 3 in this one. And the parts of the game where the Celtics really separated themselves, really went on those runs to put a lot of distance between themselves and the Pistons, were when JB was in there just like fucking cooking, man. And he was like, yeah. he was all over the place on both ends and just some, um, and we're kind of getting used to it. So I think it's important to continue to highlight his development on this end, but just trucking dudes offensively, bodying himself into the rim and just like making the decision well ahead of time. Like I will get to the rim on this play and just like absolutely executing on that desire and getting there every time. So he's just playing absolutely the best ball of his career right now and uh, not holding back against these Pistons. Yeah, dude. And like, the Pistons just had absolutely nothing for him. Like, they stood completely no chance. His last 15 games, he's averaging 28 on 53% uh, from the floor and 40% from three. We'll ignore the 66 from the line. But other, yes. than that, <laughs> you know, other than that, he's basically been completely unstoppable. And, like, even that Denver game was kind of a not a great game for the Celtics as a whole. But JB was friggin' awesome. He was... Other than Jokic, probably the best player on the floor. Uh, just completely dominant physically in a way that we all kind of felt like he could be eventually. Mm -hmm. But there's no guarantee, right? Um, and, like, watching him just, like, dribble into defenders and them just bounce off of him. And then he, like, lays it up <laughs> with his left hand. It's incredible, man. Like, and he doesn't even look phased. And can this guy get a whistle too? Like, oh my god, for how much contact he's generating at the basket, he does not really get many calls. And it's pretty ridiculous because he's got these guys in these like Jimmy Butler style positions where they're like off balance, bumping into him. There's tons of contact, and he finishes it anyway. And he just like can't get an and one to go, or can't get an and one call ever. But I just like he's not turning he turned it over three times last night but other than that that's really the first game where he's kind of had 
you know, a few turnovers, but he's been keeping the balls. Ball security has been incredible. And then when you combine that with how he's attacking, where it's like high leverage positions on the court where you think lots of turnovers were happen when mm -hmm. you're getting into the teeth of the defense and there's hands everywhere. Um, and it just doesn't matter. He's just like, oh, and the ball's at the rim, and I'm laying it up for two again. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and I think with JT out, you know, a little bit, a bit of an uptick in usage and playmaking responsibility for, for JB there. So maybe an understandable uptick in turnovers as well. It's interesting, like you, you mentioned, he he's not having much luck drawing uh, foul calls and, and getting N1s and trips to the free throw line. Do you think that's because of these new rules that have been not really uh, acknowledged as new rules by the NBA? I don't know if you heard the Zach Lowe um, pod where he had some NBA officials on his show and they, they basically just denied that there'd been any conversation to that effect. Yeah. And then against the Suns, like speaking of JB, we saw him like getting to the cup and just chicken winning Bra Bradley Beal completely out of the way and not getting called for the offensive foul. So do yeah. you think he's just like, okay, well, I could just like do whatever I want contact wise and get to the bucket. And while he's not getting to the free throw line, do you think that's kind of opened things up for him a bit? Yeah. I, I wonder, um, first of all, it's bullshit. They haven't changed anything like <laughs> offense yes. is down. Like it's like, why deny it? Like nobody's going to be mad. I, yes. Yeah, right. Exactly. It seems like everybody tends to like the change. Um, so I think that's definitely part of it. He's always kind of gotten a shitty whistle, even though he, you know, he's taken it to a next level with generating contact around the rim recently, but he's always, you know, drove hard and not gotten a great whistle. So this is just kind of an extension to that. He's just driving a lot more. So it's probably noticeable how crappy the whistle is. Um, so I don't know, but yeah, it's almost like kind of a benefit when he can like Adrian Peterson stiff arm defenders yes. in the face. <laughs> There's it works. no call. Yeah, exactly. Is it like grabbing people's hair and tossing them out of the way, um, going right to the rim? So I, I think on balance, like clearly it has not affected how the Celtics are playing, right? Because they're still absolutely crushing people. So um, they're really they're in a position where they shoot a lot of threes, right? So they're not relying on on free throws like maybe the Bucks or MB does in the same way. Um, and their guys always kind of got a shitty whistle anyway, so they're mm -hmm. just sort of used to it. Uh, so it's been working, that's for sure. Yeah, we're just bringing teams down to our level and beating them with yeah, experience right. now with a lack of foul calls. <laughs> it's great. Okay, so Jalen Brown bringing the vibes on this one. What do you got next for us, Spoonie? Okay. Um, I think we've gone too long without – a pr little PP insertion here, Ben. Oh, like, yes. <laughs> Richard <laughs> was awesome, man. Like, and he's been awesome for a very long time now, but 23 and seven. And like the third quarter, you have it in our run sheet as a ban assist bonanza, which it yes. absolutely was. <laughs> but uh, he had one assist here. I'm going to run it really quick. And I forgot to rip the sound out. So hold on one second. <laughs> I don't know. I'm that. I don't know. Neither do they. <laughs> Foot race. Dude, full transition, catches a sick little pass from Jalen Brown, and then uh -huh. goes behind the back between two defenders to Xavier yeah. Tillman. Like left this hand dude as well. Is, yeah, lefty too. That's right. Like this dude is like feeling it on a level we've not seen from him. And it's like fun to watch him dime guys up now. Like he's manipulating defenders on the pick and roll to get those lobs into Cornette and stuff. Like he's reaching a level of playmaking I just didn't think he had in him just due to kind of his size and some of his physical limitations. But holy shit, man, he's he's like so good now. Yeah, I'm so curious to see what the world looks like for Peyton. Pritchard in the playoffs and I wonder if this Bucks game coming up which we'll preview after the ad break coming up like I, I wonder if that's going to be a healthy barometer for what the rotation looks like for Peyton Pritchard in the postseason because he's been so effective in this more recent stretch for the Celtics but a lot of that is like okay we've got a nice lead here in the conference we're starting to want to um, dial back certain guys minutes and and manage loads here and there uh, so we're going to see an increase in PP but, you know, as the importance of these games uh, ratchets up a little bit, you know, how is that going to affect him? So um, he's just been so good. I want that for him so much to have an effective, solidified role in the playoff rotation. But the vulnerability is just clear for even the most, like, simple-minded 
basketball fan. Like, it's so obvious how teams can exploit his lack of size, the lack of size for PP. Uh, I'll just leave that alone. So, yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> curious, and I'm excited for this Bucks game to see if we if we get a little taste of uh, what that's going to look like for PP. But, um, no, that's a, that's a great one. And folks in the chat, let us know what vibey moments we may have missed as we continue to run down our, our diminishing list of, uh, of vibey rankings here. I'll go with... Jason Tatum just actually sitting in this game. I know. Which uh, is like an underappreciated achievement for the coaching staff in the front office. I do have uh, a photo here of Jason Tatum in the locker room shortly before the game, frozen in liquid carbonite to prevent him from uh, getting out into the court there. Uh, Totally necessary to prevent him from playing. But uh, he had mentioned in a recent interview, like especially on the road, he feels like he has to play because of traveling fans. So many people in the stands with Tatum jerseys coming to see him. Hopefully, I guess part of the conversation was like, we're at home now. These fans have seen you a bunch of times in your career because you never sit. Why don't you sit this one out, mm-hmm. JT? And it was good. Turns out we didn't need him. And just sitting there watching the game, thinking like, all this is happening and all of this is great. And our best player is getting a healthy rest. Um, really was a, a vibey moment for me, Spooty. Very vibey. Vi- <laughs> like top level vibery. I need to increase um, my and- vocabulary, right? clearly. <laughs> 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 that's like there's no other term that describes like that than vibes you know what i mean mm-hmm. like it's the perfect term sometimes you just got to use a word a lot because it makes a lot of sense there's no makes replacement sense. um <laughs> so yeah thank you jason tatum plus he got a pretty soft like 30 minutes against washington like he definitely was not going all out there was a lot of like oh, i'll just see if the pull-ups going in against washington and it was and that's kind of all we needed um so yeah we we absolutely need him to be okay with resting a few games. Uh, And maybe this is like the start of, hey, buddy, there's like three or four weeks left in the regular season. Like maybe you're going to play half the games or three quarters of the games. Please, please just let us sit you for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, Because, you know, look, it's the regular season's basically over for this team. They, like you said, they need to win five of nine to block yes. up the one seed. Like that's insane. Yeah. That's not, they might do that. They might do that. <laughs> yeah, Right. <laughs> it exactly. Might so, like they might lock it up before March is over, which is nuts. I'm not sure I can ever remember that. So just calm down, JT, you know, save it for the playoffs, buddy. We'll be good. Uh, yeah, we'll see. Uh, now, look, uh, I think we're getting to the honorable mentions part of our yeah. vibe rankings here. So I'll run, run through a couple here. You let me know what stood out to you, Spoonie. So Rondo and Scal, both in the building. Rondo talking to our buddy Cedric Maxwell, who's coming on the show yeah. in a couple of days' time. So we'll definitely be asking him about what was said in that conversation. Scal there, of course, got the, the night off work there for his birthday. Uh, not in the first row, which I thought was... Uh, interesting non-birthday telling. present from the Celtics organization. <laughs> yeah, very telling. Jaden Springer had a first-to-the-floor moment, diving to the floor and, and saving a possession for the Celtics. We had a Jalen Brown look-alike in the crowd. I do believe we have the photo uh, as well as the footage here. The Jalen Brown look-alike in the crowd. There, that, especially from behind. Look-alike? <laughs> yeah. Like, he's even got like the, the ponytail, the ninja ponytail as well, which is uh, awesome to see. Uh, and then Al Horford's son on towel duty, which I think is just a nice touch as well. Derek White came out after finally getting that 10th assist. Al Horford's son hands in the towel. And then, of course, later in the game is, is part of the uh, the criminal group pouring water on, on Derek White's beautiful bald dome. Uh, so <laughs> anything of those four in particular stand out to you, Spoonie? Uh, I, look, the Jalen Brown lookalike is hilarious. That's awesome. <laughs> like, do you think his buddies were like, dude, you look like Jalen Brown? And he was like, you think I look like him now? Wait till I go to this game and I'm full kit wankered out with like, yes. and he's he even had like the, like the sleeve thing on too, like perfectly yeah. placed on the left arm. So shout out to that guy. Um, unfortunately, I doubt there'll be very many NBA players who look like me. Uh, so, I mean, I don't think I'll ever have that opportunity, but maybe one day. Uh, but yeah, that Springer, I guess was I don't know. I think I'm a little lower on Jaden Springer than a lot of the other fans are. Like, he tries really hard. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's a good defensive player. The offense is, like, it's got a long way to go, man. Like, he almost has trouble dribbling the ball sometimes. And he's supposed to be a guard, which is not ideal. And the jumper's broken, dude. Like, it is bad. 
I was definitely leaning more towards the the good thing about Springer, and this is a very inhumane take, is like that he makes four million dollars next year. And as far yeah. as a, a trade asset, well, we have very little maneuverability with all the constraints around the second apron, a four million dollar chunk of change. Even though as long as we stay above that second apron, we can't aggregate salaries. Regardless, even on its own, a four million dollar chunk of salary is not nothing. So worst case, that's what he yeah. is to the team, which is more than nothing. So that's great. A couple of misc points from this game. Uh, I'm sorry, Jaden Springer. <laughs> Uh, Luke and literally anyone uh, in the double bigs, anyone, any other big double bigs lineup. Man, I really fucked up that phrasing. Luke and literally any other big double bigs lineup. So the last 15 games, Luke and any other big have an average net rating of plus 32.9 in a minimum of eight minutes played per lineup, which is insane and uh, very indicative of how amazing Luke Cornett has, like, suddenly been. At the end of the season, Spoonie will do the, like, what just, like, completely blew away your expectations pod. And close to the top there has got to be this, like, sudden uprising of the corn dog, the uh, Lord of the Rims, as Drew Carter has anointed him <laughs> most recently. Uh, so, I mean, I guess within the scope of this game, but just more recently and broadly, Spoonie, what are you seeing from Luke Cornett? Yeah, I, I think it's just kind of more of, of what we talked about. He just looks really comfortable running the offense and where he needs to be and what he's expected to do. Sets really He, he sets the best screens on the team, um, which I think is a really underrated skill, especially for a dude like Luke who has become like this legitimate lob threat, which is like totally insane. But like yes. he's getting dimed up on lobs like multiple times a game. Um, and then defensively, if you don't have one of those like high level pull up three point shooting guards, like, you know, Dame, Steph Curry types, Luke is going to eat your lunch, man, because he is so good at just maintaining. First of all, he's really great positionally. He very rarely fouls. And then when he gets beat you to the spot because he reads it so well, he just straight up and down rule of verticality mm-hmm. and like, He's gotten really good timing on shot blocking all of a sudden, too. Like, yeah. I feel like he was not good from? at blocking. Yeah, I know. I feel like he was not good at blocking shots last year. Maybe that's just kind of my own negative Luke related biases from years past. But man, he's like swatting people all the time now. And like some athletic dudes, when it looks like he's gotten beat, he's just coming back, knocking the ball away. Um, and like the rebounding has improved as well. Like I still think the defensive rebounding is a little bit like if there's a, if there's a weakness in his game, it's probably that for like big man backup, big man status. But, uh, he's amazing on the offensive glass. He was all over the place. I think he had six in the first half last night, mm-hmm. which is just crazy. <laughs> um, and he's just like the perfect dude. Like he just doesn't try to do too much. And I think mm-hmm. a big part of that is like he just doesn't shoot threes anymore. And that used to be a big part of his game. And now it's like just do the little stuff, set good screens, roll hard to the rim, and get in rebounding position when somebody shoots the ball. And we're murdering teams when he's on the floor, which is crazy. Yeah, dude. With double bigs, which is like <laughs> not I very did I did not expect Luke Cornett and KP to look like you know, Hakeem and Ralph Sampson out there, but they were <laughs> shit on the Detroit. <laughs> no, sir. Yeah, and you said, like, set good screens. He, like, lunges into those DHOs and sets yeah. the beefier of screens and then just, like, rolls through, like, finds the perfect rolling lane and just, like, soars to the rim like a beautiful big bird, as you said in our underrated <laughs> plays video, uh, which you can find linked in the description uh, down yeah. below if you want someone to check out after this show. So just quickly, we're just going to rush through these missed points. I'll just rattle them off real quickly and then we'll get to our ad break to leave time for our Bucks preview. But O'Shea Brissett cannot finish at the rim. That's just a point I made early in the game. And also Boston becomes the first team in NBA history to make 20 plus three pointers in four straight games. So Missoula Ball, we love it. It is the yeah. best. I want it on a t-shirt. I want to print it on my duvet so I can sleep under it every night. <laughs> Missoula Ball is the best. Uh, we're going to get back with this Bucks preview in a moment, but here's a quick word from our sponsor first. The NBA playoffs are coming and the action on the floor is heating up. Whether it sees sad little teams that haven't locked up the number one seed and are fighting for seeding or tournament season, there's no shortage of high stakes basketball moments this time of year. Get in on the excitement with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app, where you can turn your hoops knowledge into serious 
serious cash. Prize Picks even offers injury insurance, so that your entries stay live even if one of your players gets injured. For basketball games, if you have a player who exits in the first half and does not return in the second, that player projection won't count against you and the rest of your entry stays live. Porzingis is sitting on a back-to-back. You know we're going for more on Horford points, rebounds, and assists. Download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. There's that guy, Jake Eisenberg with the ad read. Thanks, Jake. Prize picks, check it out. Sign up with the code CLNS. It's a really fun way to accompany your viewing experience, just going through the, the various prize picks and choosing more or less and, and playing daily fantasy sports. Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. So highly recommend prize picks. Use the code CLNS and support the show if you want to do so. Um, this Bucks preview, uh, this Bucks game, rather, Spooner, that we're going to preview. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll just start by saying like just broadly and then we'll get into some of the numbers. I'm nervous about this game. I'm, I'm curious to hear how you feel about it because I know we've spent and you join our Discord if you want to see a lot of this, just like a lot of time shitting on the Bucks and how fraudulent they are. And yet, for whatever reason, we find ourselves at this juncture. They're the 2C, they're 44 and 24, and they have the hearts of the national media. First of all, Bucks fans in a vacuum on their own are incredibly vocal, incredibly annoying, and annoyingly positive at how much better they are than the Celtics and how much of a wash it's going to be in the in the playoffs if we do meet and then the national media seem to have jumped on that train as well i was listening to the greatest of all talk talk podcast with ben Golliver and andrew sharp great podcast that i kind of used to, to keep up with like broader nba news they both chose the bucks to win the finals to get through the east and then be the favorable matchup against whoever gets out of the west so that they've got the hearts of the national media which just annoys the fuck out of me, Spoonie. And it makes me, there's higher stakes from a Celtics fandom perspective now to go out and like win this game and shut down uh, all of those narratives. So how are you feeling going into this one? I, I'm with you, dude. Like I'm like, if we lose this game, I don't know if I can take like the conversations that's going to yes. happen afterwards. Like it's going to be so obnoxious because everyone's going to feel like, see, we told you the Bucks are the better team. But if you look at the numbers, they have not been good recently. So I don't understand what this like <laughs> undercurrent of like everybody's saying the Bucks are going to win the title all of a se- sudden. Like they're minus 5.3 net uh, per cleaning the glass, 24th in the league in the last two weeks, 10th offense, 29th defense. They're three and three in the last two weeks. Like what? what is it that they've put on tape in the last month or two that is having people change their minds like and then you look at what the celtics have done basically since the calendar flipped to 2024 and they've even taken a step up from where we were as the best team in the league in the first half of the season so i it like to me it all just comes back to like people are saying like well it's damon Giannis and jason tatum's a choker and the celtics will turn it over and fall apart and maybe that'll happen maybe that'll happen but if you're like objectively evaluating the profiles of these two teams like how can you say the bucks like should be the favorite or you're picking them like it should be the celtics as the favorite until someone knocks them out of the playoffs like it just makes no sense they're like minus 10 in march (laughs) net rating like what are we doing here the argument seems to be just like, yeah, but Giannis, like, uh, right. yes, he's, yeah. he's the Greek freak. He's incredible. We've also beaten him with like shittier, objectively shittier Celtics teams and better Bucks teams, I, I suppose. If you if you look at you know Drew Holiday and a healthier Chris Middleton, um, not in the most recent playoff matchup, sure. but I would argue that we've beaten better Bucks teams with shittier Celtics teams. And now looking at the stats on both sides, heading into this matchup tomorrow. I find it really difficult, even as I'm obviously not an objective Celtics fan at all. Obviously, I'm very extremely biased. That's what makes this show fun, I hope, for listeners out there. But even trying to be objective, I find it really difficult to, to make the case for the Bucks in this matchup, certainly in a best of seven playoff series. And then you look at their last six games. You, you mentioned they're a minus 5.3 net per cleaning the glass in the last two weeks. 29th in defense, like you said. But they were also blown out by the Warriors, who we beat by 50-something. 50. They'll Blown out by the Kings as well. They beat the non embiid Sixers. They beat the Clippers without Giannis, which I, I would say is a pretty impressive win. And they beat the Suns as well, who we also blew out. So, like, they haven't even impressed in that stretch of time despite going 3-3 three and three and beating some quote-unquote juggernauts as well. So, I'm just really not seeing it. Kawhi and Paul George, I don't think, played in that Clippers game. 
So, oh, right. okay. Yeah. And it was a really <laughs> close game. So like, I, I really don't, I just don't get it. Um, and it just seems like we are so boringly good that people need something to talk about. And they're yeah. just like, oh, well, yeah, this team's 54 and 14, but the Bucks, huh? 44 mm-hmm. and 24, like Giannis and Dame. And like that title, and I get it. He won a title. Look back at some of the injuries on the teams he went against, which is part of it, not taking anything away from that title. But that is doing a lot of work for how people talk about Giannis in the playoffs. Like three of the last four years, other than the title, they've lost in the second or the first round. Can you imagine if Tatum went out in the second or first round in the last like five years, <laughs> other than obviously that one weird Nets year where we were completely destroyed, injured, but like all people would talk about is like, Oh, he can't get it done. He didn't even get out of the second round last year. Sell the team. So yeah, Basically. right. Exactly. <laughs> it's like ridiculous, but like they won a title. So now like, the benefit of the doubt is always entirely for the Bucks. Um, but do you want to jump into like the actual matchup a little bit here? Yeah, well, I think the the first thing that comes to mind is like how will the Celtics defend the Dame and Giannis pick and roll? And the very smart folks in our Discord rightfully pointed out that what they're running more frequently is the Dame and Brook pick and roll, which to me seems like less of a mind fuck defensively, but obviously is bearing more consistent results for the Bucks. But getting back to that Dame Giannis pick and roll, the immediate concern is like, what happens with KP in drop there? Like, will he get burnt? We've seen him get burnt against less potent pick and roll conversations. So I'm curious to hear from you, Spoonie, like, how would you look at the Celtics defending that? Because for me, you hide is the wrong term, but you put KP on Brook in the corner and you have him come as late help uh if someone gets to the rim out of that out of that dame and Giannis pick and roll and then he doesn't necessarily need to immediately close out to the corner if they do make that kick out pass we can rotate from the wing kp can uh close out to the wing instead and buy him a little bit more time to get out to the shooter which is a pretty common defensive action um that's how i would approach it what about you for this this potent pick and roll combination yeah, I, I wonder if what we'll do is have KP guard like Pat Connaughton or something like that and just like keep him out of the action entirely. And then we've seen Tatum start on centers actually pretty often, um, especially centers like Brooke who aren't really going to post him up all that much. Um, so and I think the reason we might do that is because of Dame. His last 15 games, he's averaging he's shooting 42 percent from the floor but 38.2 from three and on the types of threes he's taking, like that's a pretty damn good number. So I think the last thing you want to do with Dame is let him walk into open pull-ups. So I wouldn't be shocked if we try to match the personnel where we can just switch those Dame Brook pick and rolls and make Dame get downhill and make him finish over length. Because if you're doing that, it's like, okay, you're switching Tatum onto him if he's on Brook and then what it's okay. It's Derek white on Brook. Well, like you can send help if Brooke tries to post him up. And like if we're if we're gonna lose because Brooke Lopez goes like nine of fifteen from three, okay, whatever. You know, shooting over Derek White. Okay, you know, it's just one of those games. It's gonna happen. Um, and then it's like make Dame a driver, make him finish over length, make him try to find kick out passes because he's just not athletically that dude anymore. Like he can't mm-hmm. just blow by people, finish over the top of people. Um, with some of those like insane finishes he used to have in Portland. He's just not that dude. So like keep him out of those comfortable pull-up threes. So I, I wonder if we try to game it so we can switch that every single time. Um, and then if, you know, as long as Connaughton goes, doesn't get hot, he's been pretty shitty this year. And I don't even know how much he's going to play. It's, but like, okay, Crowder, you can hide him on Crowder. Um, so I think there's options to hide KP, keep him around the rim, and you just kind of live with – Pat Connaughton taking 10 shots or Jay Crowder taking 10 shots, like whatever, go for it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you got to give up something. Yeah, I, uh, I I agree. If you can switch that action, that pick and roll action, that's ideal. And then like our scram switching and our peel switching has been really fluid this year. Yes. So if someone like Derek White does get caught up on Brook or Giannis in the post, then you can switch that out um, almost like um, uh, predictively before it actually becomes a threat. Uh, and then also, if you're not switching it, I think that Derek White and Drew Holiday, just like fighting through those screens and staying on Dame, especially if you if you factor in the added juice from Drew's perspective coming up against the Bucks for like only, what, the, the third time since the, the trade, 
Um, he's going to have some added juice there. Hopefully, he bottles that up and uses it, diving through those screens, getting skinny, and, and jumping through those screen actions and trying to stay in front of Dame as well. So um, even if we don't switch, with the stock exchange, we have the personnel to navigate those screens uh, and, and sort of keep KP out of, out of danger in that sense as well. So... Again, like we have all of the advantages. In theory, we, we should have an answer for everything that they can throw at us. And then on the other side, someone mentioned it in the chat here. Like, and this has always been the problem for the Bucks, Spoonie. But like, who's guarding the Jays? I know that Chris Middleton has come back and he's looked like kind of decent. The ankle's looking good. He's knocking down shots or whatever. Defensively, he's not who he was. And actually, Giannis has kind of always struggled guarding the Jays as well historically yep. so it's not like they have and then it's like then who is it crowder is it Connaughton? is it dame is it brooke it's none of those guys like who's guarding the jays it's the age-old question a tale as old as time for the bucks and defensively it sounds like from what we've said we can be solid if we're focused and then offensively it's just kind of more of the same as far as what we've historically thrown at the bucks and i'm not even talking about paul zingas who's just going to be like wide open threes for days uh, assuming that the bucks defense is going to have to collapse on the driving jays yeah, dude. I mean, if if KP comes out like he did last night against Detroit and just like rips off like three of five from three in the first quarter, we are going to win that game by quite a lot <laughs> mm-hmm. um, because you just want to get Brooke out from camping around the paint. And once you do that, their entire defense collapses. Um, I think it was in the discord. I'm sorry, uh, whoever shared this, but it was like the Bucks with Giannis on the court and without Brooke, their defense is horrendous. Uh, And part of that problem with Giannis is like, he's just so big. It's really hard for him to fight over screens. Like he gets caught on screens a lot and it's not, there's not really anything he could do. He's seven feet tall and like 300 pounds, you know, like he's not Marcus smart, just like diving around screens, spinning off Mm -hmm. him. So like you can pull him out, you can get him in pick and roll actions and you can, you know, we've gotten to Giannis a lot. You're right. And like Tatum, they will concede wide open pull up threes. Like the Bucks give you that shot. That's like, and it was more so when they had Budenholzer, but they still just by the nature of their personnel kind of have to defend that way when they go Giannis and Brook. And the Jays are both shooting like over 40% on pull up threes <laughs> since January yes. 1st. So, like, <laughs> that is a bad recipe for the Bucks. And then if you have to start trapping and doubling, especially Tatum, he's going to absolutely pick that that apart. He's going to get it to Derek White. He's going to get it to KP. He's going to get it to Jalen Brown. And then you're attacking four on three. And that's where this team is like absolutely incredibly dangerous. Like Jalen Brown going downhill against like a rotating defense is death. Like he just murders you. He kills you, dude. Yeah. And like, I just have a hard time figuring out how the Bucks are going to stop those things from happening other than just praying we have another ice cold shooting game, which we very yeah. much may have, but we are going to get wide open shots. Yeah, I mean, that's typically been one of the few approaches to defending the Celtics is give up the three-point shot and hope that they just don't get hot. We saw the Warriors attempt that most recently and fail miserably, but we've seen it be somewhat effective just out of pure luck or chance, if nothing else, against the Seas. So I wouldn't be surprised um, if they take on that strategy again as they have in the past and how Doc has with other other teams in the past as well. Uh, So the Celtics injury report is out for tomorrow and it's up on screen here if you're watching on YouTube. So Jalen Brown, right? Right ankle sprain. He's questionable. Sam Hauser, I doubt he plays. He's got the left ankle sprain. Questionable, which is great to see. Already just Mm -hmm. backlisted as questionable after having some doubt as to how he might look long term. And then Drew Holiday, right AC joint sprain, which is a new, I think, injury classification for him. He's questionable as well. I dare say that if Drew has any ability to physically be out there, he will play because he'll have the juice for this one, as we said. And then the Bucks injury report. They've submitted theirs for tomorrow. Probable is uh, Marjan Bochamp. He's got back spasms. Questionable is Giannis Antetokounmpo with left hamstring tendinopathy. I, I think that he'll be out there as well. And then they've got Chris Livingston, uh, Galloway, Rollins, and Washington Jr. They're all out. Apologies to those guys. I don't know your first names. Um, <laughs> I dare say that won't be a factor in the game regardless. Um, but yeah, Giannis questionable. Jalen Brown, questionable. This is a big matchup. I I would say that everyone except for maybe Hauser uh, plays this one, Spoonie. But um, hopefully healthy on both sides because this is going to be a fun one and definitely like the final relevant game of the regular season, I'd say. 
Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, like, we're shutting it down, especially if we win this game and we basically lock up the one seed with that because um, I think we get the tiebreaker. Um, will, will we be 2-1 and one against them? Or yeah, one I think two? We would, yeah, I think we'd be 2-1. and one. Two and one. So yeah, we'd lock up the tiebreaker. Um, and then I, I'm not sure if we play them four times or not this year, but we would have conference record over them anyway. So mm -hmm. we'd be good there. So it's going to get shut down. This feels like the big playoff tune up, but I wonder if Giannis plays because I wonder if Milwaukee's like, well, we want to go out thinking like our last healthy game against this team is when we beat them by 40. Yeah. Uh, we don't want Giannis to play and get blown <laughs> out and then like, oh, crap. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we do play them again in uh, early April, I we think. Do. But that'll be like, if we think this game is maybe, who knows if the, either team will take it seriously. Like that game, that definitely. One. No teams will, teams will be taking it seriously. So I really hope this is one that we can bust out the popcorn for and, and really enjoy because that, that's kind of it for a while, guys. I know that yeah. people are circling the OKC game. But that's going to be an important one for OKC and their seeding uh, and just not really um, significant for the Celtics at all. So uh, before we wrap up here, Spoonie, news of the day. So the OG Ananobi elbow situation, which I've just put in here on our run sheet because it's obviously relevant as it pertains to playoff seeding and matchups and things like that. OG was out for a little while and came back and um, Knicks fans were rejoicing. We're finally healthy. Um, Randall's on his way back. Mitchell Robinson on his way back and suddenly Woj comes out, comes out on ESPN yesterday and is like, I'm not really sure what's going on with the OG elbow situation other than like, he's going to be out tomorrow and he's probably going to be out. He didn't say indefinitely, but he like could not provide a timeline at all. Um, I'm, I'm not asking you as if you have any additional Intel on this Spoonie, but just, just your thoughts. Cause obviously this impacts the, the world of, of Celtics fans. Yeah, definitely. So I, I'll say two things. It sucks. I, I mean, I, I have a soft spot for the Knicks. I don't know why. I just think that the league is a lot more fun when the Knicks are good. Knicks I fans agree. I find hilarious and not really annoying at all compared to some of our other Eastern Conference rivals. I think it's just because they've been so bad for so long. They're like, finally, we get to have fun watching basketball. Um, and they were awesome with Ananobi. But, like, this is part of the risk of trading and paying OG Ananobi. Like he has had yeah. injury problems his entire career. It's why he slipped in the draft is because he had injury problems coming out of Indiana. So like that's a risk you run when you give up assets for a dude who struggles with injuries and it sucks. I hope he gets healthy in time for the playoffs. But if I was a Knicks fan, I would be friggin' devastated, dude. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It sucks. You're right. Um, I, I can't help but look at it as just like, obviously, we want the most resistance-free path to the playoffs possible. Right. But at the same time, of course, never wanting any injury or suffering from any other team or player. So it's, it's a tough spot to be in. Um, obviously, you, you kind of want to go through... I guess in theory, you want to go through the strongest version of every team. So when you get there, if you do, you can you can celebrate that fact. But at the same right. time, like, I just want to win the championship, <laughs> please. Yeah, uh, right. But get exactly. well soon. So bad. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but despite all that, get well soon. OG Ananobi. Now, finally, LeBron James, JJ Redick announced this new awesome podcast. I I'm really excited to ask you about this one, Spoonie, because you've kind of been like a vocal LeBron hater ever since we've known each other. And yet, for me, you know, avid consumer of podcasts, um... Guys like JJ Redick and LeBron James teaming up for a regular pod where they really dive into like the X's and O's of basketball is really exciting. I, I would equate my knowledge of basketball theory to my knowledge of like car mechanics. If something goes wrong with my car or just in general, you know, I can change a tire, I can check the oil and change the oil, I can replace the radiator fluid and do some like general diagnostics. But if there's anything really wrong with my car, I have no fucking idea what I'm doing or what I'm talking about. And my, my knowledge of basketball is sort of on par with that. I have a, a generally good understanding of the game. I can read the game. But where I'm really trying to improve my understanding of the game is the theory and the X's and O's and the modern ad adaptations of basketball theory and things like that. So this podcast really seems to speak to that. Uh, which is really exciting. And in this first episode, they talked about Jason Tatum and the Celtics and specifically about how Tatum is only 25 or was at the time of recording. And quote from LeBron, we have a lot of expectations on JT, but four conference finals appearances at that age is elite. He also mentioned that IQ or lack thereof was the reason that we lost the 22 finals and how Tatum nowadays just makes way better reads. He also said that getting Drew... And well, that we got Drew and Paul Zingas for a bag of potato chips. So I know I've thrown a lot at you there, Spoonie, but just generally curious to hear what you thought about those remarks and this podcast overall. 
yeah, well, two two big takeaways. Um, you know a lot more about cars than me. Uh, I'm embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and two, you underestimate your ball knowledge, Ben. I will definitely say that. But just classic LeBron. Couldn't have a conversation without bringing someone else down. Calls Marcus Smart and Malcolm Brogdon a bag of potato chips. Like, just the worst. <laughs> like, such an asshole. Uh, but <laughs> Yes, this is what I wanted. Gen- <laughs> uh, I will not let Re- LeBron become likable. Like, I'm not going to let that happen. Now, this is one man's crusade against LeBron James. But that said, <laughs> it was really awesome conversation. Um, I thought, especially JJ, when he was talking about Tatum, just making those reads much quicker. And I think part of that is like being a little more willing to get his teammates involved too, which they didn't really discuss. But I think that's part of it too. Like he always kind of made the reads. So, but he's reading them quicker and he's like choosing to play the right way much more often uh and it helps when one of those reads is hey the seven foot three guy is wide open like you know that's not like the hardest (laughs) read in basketball yeah what a savant Uh, i know right (laughs) uh but i I think it's just it's just interesting to see how like the internet trolls perceive jason tatum as like a playoff choker or something like that and then you have the second best player of all time and lebron james uh talking about how he is like should be celebrated for how successful he's been at such a young age. And he couldn't even get it done at, until he was 28. And JT is only 25 at the time of recording and has had all this incredible success. And like, it, it's just really good perspective about how he's perceived around the league and how he should be perceived because mm-hmm. he's had ridiculous amounts. Of, he went to the East, game seven Eastern Conference Finals leading the team as a friggin' rookie. Like, that shit yeah. does not happen, dude. Rookies Dunking are on, on the lottery Brown. teams. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, flexing in his face. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, it was it was validating to hear and somewhat vindicating. Yeah. Obviously, you know, he's not gotten all the way there yet. Hopefully this is the year or, or next year when we'll hopefully have the opportunity to bring it all back. But um, very vindicating to hear one of the more prominent voices, despite how you feel about him as a person, uh, echo our sentiments that we've held for, for Jason Tatum uh, for some time. So I'm looking forward to more of that podcast. That's immediately in the rotation. Timo in the chat here said... I feel bad for enjoying it, which I I, I subscribe to. Absolutely. Uh, And that's going to do it for this one. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Speaking of subscribing to things, please subscribe to the First of the Floor podcast. Hit that like button if you haven't already as I filibuster while I look for the button for our outro video. (laughs) Uh, Like we said, said, a reminder, we're going to be joined by Cedric Maxwell, the 1981 NBA Finals MVP, is coming on this show live on YouTube at 6 p.m. East Thursday night. So make sure you subscribe. Turn on those notifications so you don't miss that. Uh, That will, of course, be up on the podcast feed shortly after. So please subscribe uh, to the audio podcast as well. Uh, Help us with the Apple algorithm. Let the folks at Apple know that this is a podcast uh, worth listening to. Wayne Spoonie, love your work, mate. This was fun. Until next time, go Celtics. I love the Celtics!